Hello, this Hi. is Charles Eager, reporting for Leeds Living, and I'm with Katie Bray, who's singing the role of Vavara mm -hmm. in Opera North's current production of um, Katya Kabanova, which I hope I've pronounced correctly. Perfect. And I'm with Alexander Sprague. 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 Oh, right, so it's not like Prague. Not Prague. No, well, did <laughs> so you would presume that, but I'm difficult. He's weird. So, yes, well, you know, I, I, I fretted for hours over which pronunciation <laughs> I would go for. It's, it's, um, do you know what? That's, that's quite close because it's often Sprague-y or Sprague. 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 Yeah, like I've been called everything. I've been called everything. But in German, Sprague. it's Herr Sprague. So, yes, yeah, Sprague like vague. Thank you. <laughs> or the plague. <laughs> the plague. <laughs> yes, okay, so, not like Prague, but like plague. Yeah, exactly. Plague. Right, wonderful. Plague. Yeah. Yeah. Is it a German name? <laughs> um, do you know, my, my whole family history is West Country of England, but we think that it may have come maybe from a, the Fre actually a French name. All oh, right. Wonderful. Further away. Mm. Um, but we have a family tree where we traced it, and, and some of our ancestors went, were one of the first to go to America. Mm. And... Um, and then the, the name, they arrived in New Orleans and the name went all the way up the, the west side of, of America, which is really, uh, the right. east and west, mm. but mainly right. the east side rather. Sounds like a fascinating history yeah, of well, the Spray name. It. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, and what about the name Bray? Oh gosh, I think it might, I mean, I'm not actually sure. My, mm. my dad's family are all from Norfolk right. and my mum's family all come from the Isles of Scilly. So mm. we're a bit of a funny mix. Yeah. We're not quite sure. We haven't really looked into where the name comes from. Mm. Well, <laughs> perhaps if you look into it, we can do another interview. So <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, 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 a name discussion was not how I predicted that we'd start. No. I never actually said to the <clears throat> poor Leeds Living listeners that you're playing um, Varia. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, Vanya. Sorry, Vanya. 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 Yes. And your two characters are lovers in, yes. This, yes. in this story. Um, do you want to sort of summarise Katya coming over and what it's about, um, just for the listeners who aren't familiar with the opera? And, you know, sure. Just a sort of quick it's kind of basically a story of a woman, Katya Kavanova, who has married into a very strict, very backwards, kind of old-fashioned family, mm -hmm. and they live in a very um, corseted existence in a very small village. Mm -hmm. And her mother-in-law is fairly evil they cover each other mm. um she's opera's mother-in-law from hell she is the mother-in-law from <laughs> yeah. hell for sure um played by the incredible heather ship who is utterly terrifying oh. on stage and utterly glorious off stage um, <laughs> <laughs> and so anyway katya has married into this family and she feels hugely oppressed and and kind of anxious because of all these expectations she's never living up, up to any of the expectations she really had a childhood that was full of freedom and imagination and dreams mm -hmm. and all this kind of thing and it's all been killed or or at least a veil has been put over all of that by mm -hmm. her mother-in-law and her husband and just the whole way they make her live um, and so she feels like she's sort of caged mm -hmm. and she desperately wants to not feel like that and she meets this wonderful man Boris who is, sort of represents the life that she really wanted and that she hasn't had and she falls in love with him and with Vavara's help um, they have some secret meetings in this garden so Vavara uh, steals the key to this garden where she and Kudryash often meet at night mm. and she says to Katya take this key you can meet with him and it will be fine nobody will find out so she does meet with him she falls in love with him they see each other for 10 or 11 days when her husband Tichon is away um, but the guilt in the end is too much for her and she um, she admits to everything um, and she ends up feeling so much guilt and and then sort of anxiety as a result of of what she has done that she ends up deciding she can't live anymore and Boris leaves her and then she kills herself and that's the end of that yes <laughs> Yes, and it's quite a Madame Butterfly yeah. sort of ending, and I think um, Janček uh, loved Madame Butterfly. Right, didn't I didn't know that. Yes, he did, apparently. And mm. um, in a way, they're very different operas in terms yeah. of sound and everything, but they are sort of connected by that tragic heroine. Mm. I think yeah. so. Yeah. And she's sort of an outsider, as is so mm. often the case with these kind of key figures in, in operas, even mm. things like Peter Grimes or, mm. you know, lots of these, these amazingly... Um, unusual characters are often 
outsiders in, in wherever they wherever it is that they exist, they know that they don't really belong there and I think that's really compelling mm. for you know, in a storyline. Um and everyone knows that she's doomed, I think, right from the beginning, especially yeah. her. Mm. Um and I think that our characters try to kind of lighten everything and make it all okay. Mm. And Barbara believes that she could meet with Boris and it would be okay. Um, but she doesn't think it through. She doesn't mm. probably realise that the guilt would be too much for Katya and that there are huge consequences to having an affair, essentially. Yeah. It can't just be nice. Mm. Yes. <laughs> Sadly, yes. 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 Because um, Janet Yantrek's almost creating a fairy tale world at the start of your character starts with a sort of hymn to the river mm, Olga yeah, and it's yeah, beauty. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, And then there's Glasha, the maid servant mm -hmm. yes. on the stage, and she's kind of taking down your character's um, sort of sort of very highfalutin peon to the mm. river. She's like, it's just a river. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah exactly. Well, yeah, yeah well, Kud Kudriash is, 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 is the opposite of this religious um, conservatism mm. that Katie was talking about, really, and he's, he's looking to push push the boundaries for everyone just mm. to open people's minds to, mm. to what else is going on outside of the community outside of their everyday lives and their their um, routines and traditions so and nature is one of those mm. um, literature art mm. um, and you know there's that classic line uh, in, in, especially at the end uh, in the in the, at the beginning of the third act when Decoy, who is Boris's uncle, who mm. we haven't spoken about yet, mm. he's um, wonderful character. A wonderful mm. character, yeah, he is. But he's another. He's another sort of, you know, one of these the elder generation. Mm. The again very conservative, very set in his ways, and this storm is appearing, which is which is part of the climax of the opera, mm. and Kudryash is saying to Decoy, look, this if we had. Um, rods of steel. If we had these these lightning rods, we could direct the lightning away, and it wouldn't set fire to all our buildings. Yeah. And decoy saying, "What are you on about, you sh you stupid boy? Yeah. You have no idea. This is God's wrath punishing sinners." Exactly. And that's that's the battle, really. And it's yeah. that's is this nice young versus old, um, uh, and you know, conservatism versus breaking free, pushing the boundaries. And mm. we, the two, our two characters, um, are the the side of the younger and the, mm. the breaking the boundaries, if you like, and especially yeah. Barbara as well. She's yeah. that's what she's doing. She's she breaks down the boundaries so Boris and um, Katya can yes. meet each other. I think yes. an important part of why <clears throat> Barbara is like that also is that she's a foundling or an orphan or whatever yes, the, yeah. the term would be. So I imagine she's had probably a fairly difficult childhood, mm. and she also doesn't really have anything to lose. You know, she's yes. being looked after by this awful well looked after in inverted commas <laughs> yes. by this awful mother type figure um, but she doesn't really have anybody to answer to in the same mm. way that of course Katya does she's mm. unmarried she she I think feels much less responsibility but also she's had probably a, a much more difficult upbringing than some of the others which mm. maybe means that she's a bit more um, I don't know light about things or she thinks for goodness sake we don't need to get stressed about everything mm. but of course then that backfires massively she's trying mm. to do Katya a favour I think mm. by letting her find a way to be with Boris, but of course she doesn't really think it through. Yes, and <laughs> your two characters are almost sort of happy-go-lucky. I mean, yeah. when you compare how your storyline ends, yes. and it, we'll just go to Moscow and start mm. a new life, and it's totally opposed to how Katya's ends. Yes. Um, and at the same time, there is a great symmetry, I think. I think that symmetry is kind of deliberately there mm. in the... Well, probably in the play originally, mm. because it's very dramatically mm. well-crafted. Mm. And then obviously, you know, Chuck picked that up. Um, but, you know, we talked about that opposition between the sort of idealists and the realists, mm. um, and those who push boundaries and those who are conservative. And it seems like it is a sort of opera of oppositions. Mm. And, and I think sex and the sacred are kind of... Uh, in combat, mm, totally, yeah. Yeah. particularly in, in Katya's head, exactly. because she is so oppressed by by her faith mm. and by what she's being told by her mother and her husband, mm. that she is such a sensual character, and and she is desperate to feel all the things you were talking about earlier, particularly to do with nature mm. and mm. freedom and and youthfulness and and life. Basically, mm. she wants to feel vital, and she feels very dead mm. um, but Boris brings her to life and that includes very much in a sexual way and that's a huge sin to mm. her and it also is a terrifying thing because suddenly this whole world is open to her that she hasn't 
experienced mm. before and she doesn't know what to do but because the urges are incredibly strong so I mm. think it really is a lot to do with sex and oh, yeah. and the, the danger mm. of that to her anyway mm. and I think the, the our two characters probably think you know it's great don't worry about it it doesn't have to be such a big deal um but we aren't oppressed by religion i don't think either of us particularly feels no I mean, definitely I'm sure not, definitely in not. most societies in the, the period that we're talking about it probably was you know religion was obviously very yes, oppressed, but yeah. i don't think we are as kind of aware or as mm. oppressed by it certainly mm. no definitely and could Riash has made Certainly in our production, Kudriash has made the decision not to be at the church service. Yes, and um, you're obviously a, a believer in science, which then was totally exactly. like the opposite, wasn't exactly. it? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. That's absolutely, and um, you know, I, I had to review the premiere. Mm. Um, I say had to because it's always effort, but of course it was a pleasure and it was a wonderful premiere. Um, but one thing I noticed, I mean, the characters are just so rich in, yes. in this story. Um, and you mentioned Vava as sort of she's trying to offer a helping hand yes. to her sister, she's trying to bring her to life. Yes. In the same way that Boris is kind of but of course this brings her to death. So mm, there's a sort of terrible totally. tragic irony there. So I suggested in the review that although Vava is kind of presented in a very sympathetic way mm. by Janacek and by Tim Albury's mm. production, and I think rightly so, mm. there is perhaps something satanic about her in that she, you know, very much Offers the temptation. Yeah. You know, she, yeah. She's like, here's the key. Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, <laughs> I think she's yeah. not straightforwardly naive. I, I, I don't think she's sort of evil. I don't think she does it knowing of the consequences. I think she mm. just sees life in such a simple way in that she thinks, find pleasure go and, you know, if there is an opportunity to be happy, because also Varvara loves Katya, and she knows she's unhappy. There's this beautiful bit at the end of the first scene when Varvara says to Kudriash, she is so unhappy, and how could anyone not love her? How could she possibly yes. be treated like this? Mm. I love her, and we all do, and she deserves better. So I think, rather than Varvara trying to do something dangerous she's just saying, I want you to be happy. I, I know your life is miserable, and mm. this will help. But I think it's just a, a case of not looking ahead and also perhaps not, not thinking enough about the fact that Katya is such a different person to her. You know, Barbara's very free and easy and, and light um, and doesn't feel the weight of responsibility. But Katya is not like that. And she's also a very religious woman. So, yeah. so it's really too much, you know, it's too much for her to bear. And then she believes when the storm comes, that it's, it's because of her, that mm. she has made that storm happen and it's her punishment. And, you know, uh, she says, what does she say? Well, anyway, she says something about how the storm is because of what what she has done. Um, so, I don't know, it's interesting what you say about Barbara. I think she she is a sort of the, the reason, actually, it all goes wrong because she facilitates their meeting. Um, so, like you say, she, instead of bringing Katya to life, she, she does bring her to death. Mm. But I wonder if Katya is also the sort of character that would have found tragedy in her life, whatever happened anyway. Because mm. I think that she is, she has that in her, you know, can't mm. imagine her ever being happy. Yes. <laughs> I think the worst that Barbara is guilty of is probably just a naivety. Yes, maybe, mm. yeah. And, and just that, that, you know, like we talked about you, youth and age and... and mm. That, you know that you look at um, at um, Kabanicha, the mother, and the way you know. See what I my mother. I told you. Yes, yes, you know. Yes, see, yes. I told you, and and it's that you know the experience mm. versus yes. that you know just the, probably Vavra hasn't had hasn't seen mm -hmm. this tragedy, so she wouldn't have foreseen this in any mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. um, living in the world that she had done, that mm -hmm. that would have been that these consequences would have had. It's probably the first time maybe she's even known death. Perhaps I don't know, maybe. but maybe not. Yeah. Maybe not. But it's probably the first time she's seen. That's a suicide. Yeah, yeah. Although she doesn't actually see it, does she? No, we've gone by like, then, but yeah, yeah. She, I think she knows it's coming. She knows it's coming, yeah. yeah. Which is another sort of negative thing about both of our characters, in a way, or maybe maybe for you the only negative thing, I think, is that I think you're trying to help Vavra when yeah. you say, let's go to Moscow, but it's also <coughs> a, a quite... Selfish. Se cowardly and selfish moment for both mm. of them, isn't it? That, they're scared of what they've done. Varvara is terrified that it's her fault and mm. that she knows Katya's going to now do something terrible. Um, 
or maybe she thinks that she's going to be next in line. I did wonder if, I do wonder if maybe she thinks that Kabanicha will always need a sort of project mm. <laughs> and that when Katya has gone, it will be Vavra who's next to be locked up in the, in the wherever it is mm. and, you know, treated like, uh, like a prisoner. Um, but either way, I find it very difficult this moment when we say, okay, let's go, let's just go. And she doesn't mm. say goodbye to Katya or, you know, and I understand that they're trying to save themselves, um, but it seems to me, as Katie, it seems like a like um, a difficult moment to understand why you know Katya's best friend would just yeah. leave. Everyone lets Katya down. Everyone. Mm. Yeah. Everyone lets her down. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm. Yes, even Boris. Boris, oh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Boris, yeah. Boris. You he know, can't when, handle yeah, that. Yeah, he can't. Nice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he, he, I mean, you you can sort of you know you can maybe try and look at it innocently and Boris you know maybe Boris ha ha was was for, was sent away and he, there's nothing he could do but mm. it really they are every single both men let her down mm. and and certainly Barbara lets her down yeah. I mean you know let, as I say every, everyone lets her down yeah, really. yeah. They do. Mm. and and the men look particularly weak mm. yes mm. all of them yes well her husband is probably the, the finest example yes. um, and uh, Kabanicha, the mother, yes. they're just a wonderful pair, aren't they? I know, it's amazing. Uh, so much evil in the mother yes. and so much weakness it's in the son. Totally, he's yeah. completely under her farm and he, he can't get out. But mm. I think that we've seen that relationship before. Yeah. I think that's quite a familiar thing, isn't it? Powerful mm. mums and mm. slightly scared sons. <laughs> scared sons, yeah. <laughs> and Terrified. And he has this rather tragic reliance on drink as well. Oh, totally, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think if that's in the... St I mean, that seems to be one... Uh, in the other productions I've seen, it seems to be a recurring theme. Is it in yeah. the... Is it, it in well, the I say to him, for instance, in the first scene... Oh, you do, don't scene, you, John? I say, I know what's on your mind. I know that you'd rather be in the pub, basically. Mm, yeah. And so I think that he... I think we know that he drinks heavily. And mm. also, Katya talks about how he gets violent when he drinks. So oh, yeah, so it's in, it's in the score. Is, well, I misunderstood yeah. that line, actually, because I always thought that you were talking that he... When you said... When you were talking about him, that mm. he's only ever nice to her when he's got something else on his mind as it were. Oh. But that's, that's fine, you're, you're talking about alcohol. I think that's I mean, I know that you'd rather be, yeah, down <clears throat> the yeah. pub. I see. Yeah. Well, that just goes to show the richness of the text. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you could, yeah. In, and and well into the production, you could still reinterpret it. Absolutely. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. There, there's always room for that. But actually, also as well, you, you have to take a lot of what is said with a certain amount of pinch of salt, as it were, because we are translating it away mm -hmm. from the original Czech. Yeah. yeah. Um, into English, so things do get lost and mm. they are changed. And even even as we rehearsed, we changed the translation. Not normally massive things, but just yeah. certain things to make it slightly clearer yeah. or, or to fit better with the vo the vocal line, um, uh, certain yeah. vowels. Yeah, so yeah. It, it it does change the story slightly. And we had been there were a few lines, bigger lines that were changed. Um, when we had big discussions over yeah. with the director, with Tim, over certain things to try and put what we wanted to put across for the story. So mm. there is an a, a artistic license there, for sure. A little bit. Yeah. We, we haven't no. changed the No, thing. not massively. No, <laughs> the odd, you know, it's small. She doesn't things. actually die, we just changed it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, sp I suppose it has to happen if you're going to sing a Czech opera in English. Yeah. And one of my questions actually was going to be, is it better in Czech or is it better in English? Yeah. Gosh, I don't know. I I I've only sung one other opera in Czech, and it's I mean it's a beautiful language to sing in. I um, I totally understand the choice to sing in English because I think whatever we can do to get everything really clearly across to our our audience mm. in this country, um, given that we're performing it here, I sort of feel like that's really positive. It's also mm. easier for us to really connect with the story because we're all English. You know, English English is everyone's first language. Mm -hmm. I think in this cast, that's right. Yeah. Isn't yes. it? Um, and and I think Czech is one of the more unusual languages for us to perform opera in, and mm -hmm. it can feel quite isolating for the audience and for us. Um, mm -hmm. But I also totally believe in the power of doing things in their original language, mm -hmm. particularly when they've been composed in, in such a particular sound world that includes the sound of the words of the language, yeah. so much. 
and, and it is a yeah, must sound. I mean, Janicek would be turning <coughs> in his grave, I've no doubt. But at least it's being performed. But you know, it 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 must make such a difference to the whole world of it and how he wrote it. There's so much to do with those vowels and consonants and all of those sounds. I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, it's yeah, ab absolutely. I think it's some. We've got to be careful sometimes to not be. Um, not disrespectful, but mm. um, you know, but to be careful to because if you compare, say, someone like Benjamin Britten, mm. who when he, if you if, imagine a Britten opera translated mm. into another language, and I'm sure it has been done, yeah, and I'm, I'm sure. sure it's done, mm. um, and if it helps a local audience understand it, yes. But when um, Benjamin Britten wrote, every single line was was so. Um, specific to the words and the inflections of mm. the phrase in the English and to fit the vowels for mm. the and, and he knew exactly he was so um, genius at, at his writing of the of, of use of words yeah. and it's the same with Janicek and he would have where his lines and the music that he wrote would have been specific to his language that totally. he was writing for totally. so it's sometimes you've got to be you know it's, it's you've got to be careful not to be disrespectful to the composer yeah. in saying well actually what you spent hours perfecting, yeah. we're going to sort of take apart slightly because it does change so much of the music. Mm. Um, you think we'll just change the, the words, it's not a big deal, but actually it changes the shape of the melodies. Totally. And, yeah. um, so, so it does make a difference. Mm. Um, in answer to your question though, I, I, ha I haven't actually sung in Czech, I haven't sung this in Czech, mm. so I, I don't know, but I know it's a very wordy language mm. and, and actually the piece is very wordy, so I wonder whether it makes a big difference whether we a actually have to add more words in English mm. to fit the notes that are in the music, mm. do you see what I mean? Is That's yeah. what I'm talking about with the, the, um, the translation of it where you have to yeah. be very careful, but... Um, but as Katie says, it's so important that what we do tells a story mm. and resonates with the audience yeah. and if we can be if we can deliver our message and there are so many messages in this opera yeah. if we can deliver that with immediacy that is much more emotional for the for the audience listening then that's that's a, that's only a good thing yeah mm. totally yes and i think it succeeds very yeah. well because um yeah, good. I was, that, that was my first ever encounter with catch cover mm. last mm. week and uh yes yeah, so all those messages <laughs> certainly uh made their way across yeah to me, and, um, <laughs> and it's been turning them over in my head Mm. Yeah, since, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, right. Well. Well, you know, before we recorded, you were telling me some interesting things about the psychology mm. of getting up there and seeing an opera, and I think this would be a fascinating thing for our listeners at Leeds Living to hear about. So, do you want to just sort of, I mean, what goes into um, performing an opera, and especially an opera like Janicek's, which is very complex. Mm. Who do you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, what goes into it? I mean, I suppose the first thing when you're when you know that you're doing whatever role you're doing is to get to know the score as intimately as you can, get to know the text as intimately as you can. Hours and hours of sounds like of very hard work. Practice. Practice. No, yeah, well, it's, it's it's preparation, but it's it's really key preparation. And, yeah. and um, you can't um, yeah. uh, fast track it. You just no. have to put the hours in. You know mm. because. Partly because this score is particularly complicated, but I think with any score, you, the, what you need to do, in, in my opinion anyway, before you turn up to the first day of rehearsal is know it inside out. So you can sing it whilst also doing the ironing or mm. running or whatever it is that, you're, that you do. So it's so much a part of you that then when you turn up and you're directed to do all sorts of other things, you can still deliver the text and the music as it's meant to be, you know, but this score is so difficult that we've had a longer process probably of mm. preparing it and having music rehearsals and we still make occasional small mistakes because um, every night there might be one little bit that goes slightly different or, or you make a tiny mistake or you're a semi-quaver early or late because it, we're all trying incredibly hard mm. for that not to happen mm. but you can sometimes just slightly lose your way and I hope we all know it well enough now to very quickly fix that. But um, but it is probably the most complicated score for most of us will will have done at least for a while or maybe mm. ever I don't really know. Um, but anyway, so part of the preparation is just getting to know it as well as you possibly can, and then I suppose part of the preparation, like for any role, is somehow building up your confidence not only for the singing part of it but for being able to take risks on stage. So mm. if your director wants you to do something that ordinarily is slightly outside of your comfort zone or something. I find 
it's very important to try to be as brave as you can, mm. even if in the moment you think, gosh, this is uncomfortable, or I haven't done this sort of thing before, or I'm not sure I can. I think we're all capable of doing much more than we think. And I think that the biggest exercise that we do regularly is one of finding kind of courage to just have a go. A bit like you were saying earlier mm. with singing, that sometimes you just have to have a go. And, and you usually find you can do more than you thought. Um, or that something actually is possible, um, even if you that morning thought it wasn't going to be possible. Um, so I suppose, I suppose just being slightly, um, what's the word? Just just having the attitude that it's always worth trying. I think is really important. I think in our job, often people are very nervous about doing things that they're that are slightly outside of their comfort zone because we're always thinking also about the fact we have to sing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, physically it means sometimes we feel inhibited or yeah. that you think I need to be stiller or something. But in my opinion, it's always good to to try physically to kind of do whatever is, is demanded of you or asked of you. And it might not work, but I think we can always have a go. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really liberating because you usually realise Oh, actually, that is possible. I don't need to stand like a statue <laughs> and sing. I can move and sing at the same time, for instance. Yeah. Alex is going to say I, something. No, I just going to say, it's, it's really interesting what you say, because, um, you know, we're, we, I believe now that opera singers, we're such multitasking animals when we're, when we're on stage, and, 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 and you can't do everything at once, so that's why we spend so long rehearsing. Mm. Um, because you have to build up the layers and the muscle memory. So as Katie was saying, you know, you would spend, if say there was a six week rehearsal period, before that you need to make sure that you know you can sing mm. every single line. Well, ideal, in an ideal world, yeah. if you turn up to day one of rehearsals, knowing your music, it being in your, your muscle memory, in your body, so you've rehearsed, that you've worked with your coaches or your teacher. Mm. So when it comes to day one, if the director says, okay, right, I'm gonna hang you from the ceiling upside down, <laughs> and now you're gonna sing that really hard phrase, mm. that you can trust that the phrase is in your body, ideally, and, and do what's been asked of you. Yeah. Um, and, this is, and this is one of the interesting things about opera nowadays, compared to say 30 or 40 years ago, um, when there was much more a, ge a, a generation or a, a tradition of, of very grand productions but not a huge amount of acting, lots yeah. of standing and singing. Yeah. Stereotyping, I know slightly, broad brush strokes, but generally. And now, now we're expected to do so much more and, and, and uh, opera singers have to be all singing or dancing, yeah. and, and literally in some cases. Yeah, and, I think and, that's great. That's and, which really is, positive. yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and as Katie says, we're being constantly asked to do more extreme things mm. um, on stage, whether that be, you know, physically or, or mentally or emotionally mm. or vocally. Mm. But, you know, with modern composers, someone like, say, Thomas Adez, who, who chooses deliberately to write music that pushes to the extremes of, of the human voice. Mm. So we're, we're pushed from every angle. And, and that's why we rehearse for, for so long. So, so when we get onto the stage and the audience is suddenly there, that you you know everything is in the body you know muscle you've you've done it you've done it you know the little demon on your on your shoulder that says you can't do this you can't do this what are you doing standing in front of all these people you can sort of say right I, I know I can do this because I've been doing this mm. and and you stand and, and do it and and as Katie was was talking about this piece as well it's um one of the the interesting things that you wouldn't get unless you've ever been a, a singer on stage with a, with an orchestra is the um, the way in which you hear the the music, and it's so we have speakers that, that play back the orchestra onto the stage, so we get a more immediate sound. Otherwise, it's delayed. Mm. And and what you find is that at, when you're singing, and the, one of the most difficult things is if you lose yourself in the emotion or, or the acting of what you're doing, it's so easy to, to fall out of time with the orchestra. It happens in like the blink of an eye. Mm. You'll be behind or you'll be ahead or you've mm. missed an entry and mm -hmm. and and you know you because you can you can just if you just spend a little bit too much emotion. So you're constantly juggling delivering drama and delivering your voice but also singing in the right place. Yes. Which means that you've kind of at the corner of your eye even though you're delivering something, you know, trying to put, put, put across an emotion, 
you're making sure that am I okay I need to listen out for the over entry here because that means I've got two beats until I come in there's the conductor go and and you're it's a constant juggling act so um yeah <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a prospect of utter terror. No, it's not. <laughs> but it, yeah, it's it, it, it can be, but it can also it's it's amazingly exciting, and and the adrenaline does amazing things, and the feeling afterwards is 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 really you know unrivaled. Mm. But you know that's what I say. That's why we, we rehearse for so long, mm. for six weeks or more, mm. so we know that you know we we're ready to do it. We, mm. we it's it's. It's in the it's in the it's in the system as it were. It's just repeating, repeating, repeating. And I think also in a in a kind of general being a human way, it's kind of amazing to push ourselves in this way because you're always sort of stretching yourself. So your brain is being challenged so much, particularly in a piece like this, and you're always capable of of, of somehow getting there in the end. You just are. You think, God, how on earth am I going to be able to do this? And now we can. You know, the first yeah. kind of. On, on first opening the score, there were bits and I just thought, oh my goodness, I <laughs> have no this. idea what's happening. How am I going to be able to find these notes and these rhythms and everything else? But now it's there. And I think it's, it's an amazing lesson in, 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 like I was saying before, challenging yourself and actually discovering that you can always get there in the end if you're prepared to put all the time in and you have a wonderful team around you. And actually in this particular show, we've yes. had the most fantastic yes. team of people. Yeah. Um, Sean Edwards is just an amazing yes. woman, amazing conductor, incredibly supportive, really on it. She knows this piece like she wrote it herself. Yeah. And that's incredible. We need someone like that at mm. the helm. And Tim Aubrey is, is a genius and he's mm. a wonderful man and he's very um, detailed in his mm. direction. He's ve he pushes us really hard in a way that I think is really good. Because you see the results, you, yeah, yeah. So and he believes so much in in the detail and making it as real as possible. And he said to us in one rehearsal, "I want it to be like like I'm filming you up close in HD, yes. so the detail is is like you know like the audience is right there in front of you. You don't have to do mm. big opera hands and big you know standing center stage in the spotlight nonsense. It needs to be real and just just be a person." And it will, it will totally carry all the way to the back of the stores because if your intention is right and you've put the thought and the detail in, into it, it really does work, I think. I mean, I believe in his approach entirely. Yeah, it's yeah absolutely. No, it, it, absolutely. And, and, it's, and it's, it's good. We, I think it's important to talk about the director and, and the composer, not only those, but actually everyone backstage because you know, we're, we're the, you know, we're the icing on the cake or whatever. We're not even that with the hundreds of thousands on the cake, but <laughs> there's, there's so much going on, yeah. um, behind stage, you know, we, yeah. we're, there are, there's normally 30 people probably backstage yeah. in some shape or form, yeah, either yeah. doing our makeup or making sure our costumes in exactly the right place and, or changing and the set, there are some changing enormous the set, scene changes yeah, that yeah, enormous scene changes so quickly and, with these huge walls and I don't know how they do it, but it's getting quicker and quicker and quicker. It's a very difficult thing to be doing. It's a lot of Absolutely. skilled. Yeah, and there's people. lots of really skilled people that make sure that all we have to worry about is sing. That's literally what we have yeah, to watch, go out on stage and because act. yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I, I and, and act and act. But I, you know, I arrive in my dressing room. I I, I sit down and then at, at a lot of time and and. Um, Joe comes in and does my makeup for me and does my hair and then there's you know um, uh, there's people there helping us with our, our our dress you know getting getting dressed if we need to they take it when we get unchanged they take it from us and hang it up so we're you know not in a deaverish way but just that everything is take you know I walk to the side of the stage and I'm handed my props and and you you so all we everything is channeled so we just worry about the acting and the singing. <laughs> And a lot of hard work goes in, and those and every person who's involved takes their job extremely seriously, yeah. and, and yes. they're vital. Yes, and you can absolutely see that in mm. the yeah. productions. I mean, I always get excited when there's a Tim Albury production. Oh yeah, so, yeah. yeah they're always it's wonderful. So well thought out. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, so, and what doesn't does... miss a trick. You can't yeah. get away with anything. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Yes, and I've never encountered Sean Edwards' work She's before, but the wonderful. the orchestra sounded amazing on yeah. Saturday. So yeah. yeah, it's a great team for you guys to be it working is a with. Great team. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Right. Um, well, we're just past half an hour. I wonder if I might just cherry pick one or two more questions. <laughs> um, I'll cut the, these bits, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, this might be a slightly plebish question, but. They can be no. quite good no. questions. 
Um, do you have a favourite moment in the opera? Oh. <laughs> I love the bedroom scene with Barbara and Katia when she talks about her dreams of how she wishes she could be a bird and mm -hmm. fly away. Uh. The scene sort of disintegrates as it goes on because she she slightly loses her way and becomes hysterical but at the beginning there, there's so much beautiful music and it's it's so kind of dreamlike I, I really enjoy that bit but I think probably my favorite 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 bit of music is actually in the overture if it's called the overture in this piece um, there's a, a, a moment about 10 bars long when the harmony changes in, in such a specifically incredible way it kind of gives me goosebumps and we're all standing behind the curtain at that point waiting for the curtain to go up mm -hmm. so we're really all there on the stage kind of in that moment and also I, I, I find that that's a really important moment in terms of kind of getting yourself ready you know mm -hmm. the character for the show and you know the curtain's about to go up and you've got this minute or two to get in the zone and I just think that, that, that there are moments in the overture that are just astonishing, particularly sort of harmonically, but the orchestra obviously are having a great time playing it as well, so that really comes across. Do you have a yeah, and uh, you know, I, I agree actually, I think the, the overture is, is also, is, it's so, it, there's lots of little kind of film music um, mm. echoes that I hear that may have been taken or borrowed or whatever yes. more recent in films and it's so cinematic and, yeah, it's, and it's amazing um, and it really gets gets the emotions going but I think actually probably our little strophic song mm. oh, that, that little gorgeous. simple the little um, folk the song two scene two yeah the yeah. Yeah. Scene two, yeah, yeah, it's exactly. one of my favourite moments just, it's just the real in the, just a, a huge moment of simplicity yeah. actually in, in, a, in what is a complex opera and a complex sound world is that this this Finally, a little strophic song and just very little, un, un, uh, very little accompaniment yeah. in the background. I don't even know what it is really. Maybe just a it's little bit of strings or maybe some harp, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and not not very much else, and and very beautiful harmonies. I think that's mm -hmm. a really a really nice moment. It's a beautiful moment, and it also probably comes as a bit of a relief because mm -hmm. the piece is so busy and stressful most of the time. Because suddenly <laughs> there's this kind of <laughs> moment of calm, yeah. and and like you say, simplicity yeah. and a folk tune and mm -hmm. all that kind of. Thing is very touching and I think very welcome at that point mm -hmm. and then of course it all explodes again afterwards so it's this kind of time like the calm before the storm yeah right? absolutely and very quickly mm -hmm. afterwards as well yes yes when, exactly. when Boris and Katya arrive back on stage yeah, a few, yeah, yeah. only a few seconds later yeah. really and then the, the orchestra whizzes up again yeah, 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 yeah builds totally. up again and yeah and off we go mm. Mm. You know, I agree with you I mean uh, you got this sort of mesh of ridiculously complex modernist opera for yes. an hour or whatever it is, and then it just it's so sweet and simple. Yes, and I think it's yes. the, the, yes. best, the best composers do know when to use simplicity yes. effectively. Like oh, that. totally. Yeah. Mm. And I remember Tim saying, I really want in this moment for everyone in the audience to wish that they were this couple. Yes, yeah, because we were. Yeah. Goes, oh my <laughs> yeah. goodness, and how simple and happy they are, and yeah. it's all okay. You know, this is the the one sort of really light moment in the whole thing. And of course, we know that that over in the corner there's something much darker mm. happening. But that is that moment on stage and musically and that in contrast way, is, is just really important. Yeah, yeah. gloriously yeah. light yeah and it's such a beautiful melody and it's probably the only one from the whole opera that you would sing on the way home mm. you know it's very difficult to sing some of the <laughs> other <laughs> no, <laughs> yes and um the, the wonderful compliment to that is um towards the end of that scene when Katya and Boris are off stage and you guys are on stage. Yes. And I think your character is saying, oh, what if Kapanitra finds out? Yes. And yeah. you're reassuring him. Don't worry, it's going to be fine. Yes, yes, yes. Reassuring him of your yes. genius and so yes. on. And the harmony behind it is totally. just terrifying. It's very <laughs> haunting, yeah. isn't it? You think, yeah. oh, there's something really nasty sort of yeah. looming. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, absolutely. And that little, there's a little moment as well when, when you can hear the clock there's a little chiming of the clock in the percussion and, and, and you say, well, how are we going to know what the time is? As well, I can hear that it's, it's one o'clock, but it's, mm. it's also that inevitability of, of time ticking yeah. forwards and, and yeah. that it's going to catch up with you and futures, it, you know, what's happening next. And, yes. and uh, yeah, even under that, even in that nice scene, the underlying message is strongly there. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. Yes. The storm is brewing. It's the brewing storm is brewing. Big yeah. time. Yes. And that, <laughs> this isn't really a question, but I just realized the other day, the storm, well that's one translation, you know, us 
Ostrovsky's play, is that his name? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's also The Tempest, isn't it? So he was probably thinking of Shakespeare when he oh, wrote see. that play. Although, of course, Shakespeare's Tempest is the other way around. It starts with The Tempest mm -hmm. and then has a comedic ending. I see. this has been this flipped, has over, been flipped yeah. over. Yeah. yeah. So I, I hadn't thought about that. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not sure. No. no, I wonder. I mean, obviously, Shakespeare. Yeah, I'm well, sure there are influences, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, of course. Um, well, somebody needs to do some kind of research project. Ostrovsky's <laughs> reading could be, Shakespeare. Could be a dissertation, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for someone who knows Russian. Yeah. yeah I'm going to leave that yeah. someone else to do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. I'll stick to the scene. Well, at least now we've planted the seed of the idea, so <laughs> one of Leeds Living's more um, erudite listeners could, uh, like could take up the yeah. project. Answers on a postcard. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe just two more questions. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose the last question is probably going to be the closing question because, well, sorry, the first of these two questions is going to be the closing question because the last one is so silly that I'll probably just have okay. to cut it. Um, but do you guys have any other engagements or appearances coming up that you're excited about that you want to talk about? I don't know. Go on, spread you about well, to you go to France first. or something, haven't you? Um, yeah, well, after this, I'm going to uh, overlap slightly with the, the last show, but my um, I'm going to... Opera Nationale de Lorraine in Nancy to do um, uh, Wuthering Heights, um, which is a Bernard Herrmann um, interpretation of Wuthering Heights, mm -hmm. and uh, which I'm really looking forward to because um, I'm well, the, the the character that I'm playing has a, a really stunning aria, which is really, really nice, mm -hmm. um, and then yeah, then I'm I'm in France for a little bit longer after that in Strasbourg, which is about an hour away, doing mm -hmm. Don Giovanni, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, so, so, some, some nice things, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a bunch of concerts coming up, including some um, a concert at the Barbican in a couple of weeks, which I'm very excited about. And mm -hmm. um, that's lots of both Italian Wonderful. Um, leader book um, things. And then I will be going to Irish National Opera, which is my the first oh, time really? I've been there. We're doing um, a Vivaldi opera called Griselda, mm -hmm. um, which isn't done very often. In fact, I think this is this is the first time it will have been done in Ireland ever. Which is quite exciting, um, and I'm playing Griselda in that. I haven't even started learning it, so I should probably get on with that because that's going to be that. millions Hopefully of notes. Fergus isn't no, it's here. okay. It's not. <laughs> it's not for quite a long time. So oh, I think I think I will start. You've got time. Good. Do you, are, is that performed in Wexford? Are they is that where they're now based? No, you, it's or in uh, Dublin. We we rehearse in Dublin and then we go on a tour all over the place. Um, yeah. but I haven't really spent any time. I've never been to Dublin and I haven't spent any time in any of the other places either so I'm very much looking forward to spending lots and lots of weeks in Ireland and exploring a bit um, and I love I, I love Baroque music and Peter Whelan is conducting and he's just a brilliant human being and an incredible musician so um, that, that's my most exciting bit of that project is, is him. Wonderful. I'm sure you'll have an amazing time. I hope so. Yeah, they're, <laughs> they're a really nice company so yeah. Good. Oh, really and <laughs> playing the title role as well would be yeah, quite wonderful. A bit of a rarer opera as well. Yeah, so I, I actually hadn't heard of it until about a year or so ago. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, so hopefully you'll popularise it and I'm sure it'll, play, it'll be played everywhere and we'll be on our, you can come back to we'll Opera North and do it. Yeah. Yes, yes. yes, and I didn't know that Bernard Herrmann uh, actually did any operas. Obviously I know it's film music, which is all Yeah, wonderful. well, it, it, yeah, it's quite, it's quite a filmy. I'm not sure exactly when he wrote it, maybe in the 60s. Mm. Um, so around the time of Psycho, which was ninety six. Okay. Was oh, probably well, his yeah. most popular score. Oh well, there we go. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's yeah. I I don't. I haven't studied the whole opera. That what what I have listened to it is very filmy. Mm. Um, so and you know it's it seems nice enough music. It's obviously not a very mainstream opera at mm. all. Mm. Um, and it's in English, so it's interesting. Well, we'll, we'll I'll, I'll be I'll be interested to to learn a bit more about it, but. Um, yeah, I, d I don't know of him at all, actually, as a, as a, or any of his film stuff. But when you say Psycho, then that rings oh, yeah. a bell. He did Psycho, Vertigo, Taxi Driver, oh, uh, Citizen Gosh. Kane, I think. He, you know, oh, very good. If it's the same Bernard mm. Herrmann. Yeah, um, sure. yeah, his name's like I'm sure it is, yeah. practically yeah. every... Yeah. <laughs> it's right, kind of like Corngold, although of a, yeah. sort of yes. like the next uh, generation. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. You, you hear the film day job in, in the classical. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, but he's... Uh, you know, a wonderful dramatist like Janáček mm. in his mm. in his film music, he really paints with the mm. orchestra. Yeah. Obviously, from the famous Psycho shower scene. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Violins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Hopefully, there's nothing like as scary as that in in, no. in this opera. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, not in Wuthering Heights. No. Yeah. Yes. 
And so the last question is, is so silly, but oh, um, it, might, it might be illustrative and therefore educational for Leeds Living's listeners um, about the difference between a professional singer and someone who can't sing at all. Do you want to give me a quick singing lesson in maybe Janacek or something? <laughs> <laughs> and and if, it's, if it's so stupid, we can just cut it, but... <laughs> Oh my gosh, how did we do that? I don't know. A singing lesson in terms of what, in terms of... I really don't know. Um, I was hoping <laughs> you guys would know. Uh, this is just a sort of balmy idea I had before coming out. But, uh, a Janicek right, so, singing lesson? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Maybe, maybe the little strophic song or something, if you want to oh, sing we, a, a line well, or something. <laughs> have, you, have you got your score with you? No, well we could, we could try to teach you the I could maybe try and learn it by ear. Pardon? I could maybe try and learn it by ear if you guys. You could try and learn it by ear. Yeah. We could sing the beginning of your, um, uh, you know, the bit with the folding up the rug aria. Oh, um. How's it go? <laughs> <laughs> oh, for, you mean unfold your folding up? Oh, yeah, so we stayed my la la la. That bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, do you want us to teach you a bit of this thing? Yes, yeah, that'd be good. Okay. Yeah. How does it go? So, we, what are your lines? Well, what we've got are your words? Yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh, it's going to be high. Okay. What are the what are the lines? Let's do one line. Um. So we stayed, my love and I. Is okay. that the first one? Yeah. So we stayed, my love and I, till the dawn was in the sky. Should we try that bit? Okay. So, so we stayed, stayed my love and I, till the dawn was in the sky. And then the next bit's a bit easier. I lady, lady, lady. Should we do that bit first? Yeah. I lady, 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 till the dawn was in the sky. Till the dawn was in the sky. Beautiful. It's beautiful. Well, I heard, but uh, not so much. Uh, well, you were close to the microphone. So I, did. I made sure I sung more quietly. Um, yeah, so I don't think I'll sing solo, although I'm sure that would be very educational for the listeners as to what, what levels of skill separate us. Yeah. But, but that was wonderful. That was a lovely way of ending. So, um, well, thanks so much. For Thank that. you. Well, it's Thank been you. a wonderful interview. Oh, so, thanks so much nice for your time, and uh, good luck with tonight's performance. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. much. Right. Thank you.